guy who kicks off the NBC Sports on Peacock, uh, Lollapalooza, every single day um, with PFT Live. Uh, and he's a must-follow at Pro Football Talk on Twitter. And his new book, Playmakers, is still available where all books are sold. Mike Florio on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line. How you doing? Hey, Mike? Rich. I'm doing great, buddy. How are you? Well, I mean, during the commercial break uh, at the end of uh, hour number one, um, I read, uh, I guess, the relevant material in the 24th, 24th civil lawsuit that's been filed against uh, Deshaun Watson, and again, I know uh, innocent and pill proven guilty, and he says that there is nothing to see here, essentially, and there were no criminal charges filed. Uh, I, I do want to, for due diligence, say that, but I'm appalled and disgusted by what I read, and I'm wondering what what is what do you think is happening now that um, you know the league is investigating him or is uh, through with its investigation or close to the end of the investigation, and there's still more civil suits being put out there. Mark. Rich, I think in some respects the tide of public opinion took a negative turn against Deshaun Watson to the extent that members of the jury of the court of public opinion weren't already on that, that side. When Rusty Harden, who represents Deshaun Watson, said on Houston Radio Friday, basically there's no crime in having a massage become a sexual encounter. There's no crime in trying to make it happen. There's no crime, therefore... Deshaun Watson did nothing wrong. Now, he didn't pin it together that clearly, but given the context, it was obvious what he was saying, downplaying this idea that if Deshaun Watson did indeed get massages lined up with the hope that they would become sexual encounters and actively tried to make that happen, there's nothing wrong, everything's fine, no problem. I think the reaction to that suggested to me that people are starting to realize the evidence could be overwhelming as it relates to the pattern, the practice, and the habit. And this is the thing that jumped out from the first page of the new lawsuit, the 24th lawsuit filed against Deshaun Watson. The notion that Watson seeks out random strangers on Instagram for massages, as he has done more than 100 times. That's the allegation straight from the complaint. And this is written by the lawyer that represents all 24 of these plaintiffs. So I'm assuming this allegation that he's gone to social media more than 100 times to seek out random strangers for massages, that's founded on some sort of fact that's been developed in the case. And if that's the case, it's just kind of jarring. And it, and it confirms kind of the know it when you see it. This is what's really going on. He's using these massages as cover for trying to steer them toward a sexual encounter. And as it turns out, 24 of the people objected and were offended and have decided to pursue their rights in civil court. And this is just a mess for the NFL. And I know they've taken paid leave off the table. I think based on everything that's happened in the last week, it may be time to put paid leave back on the table, at least as something to consider while Roger Goodell figures out what to do. That's the exempt list is what you're referring to. Yeah, right? the exempt list doesn't play until these cases are resolved, and then a decision is made on discipline. And, hey, if he's determined to fight these cases, they're going to last into 2024. Now, if he's not playing football, there's more months available in the calendar to go to trial. But you're still talking about trying to have 24 separate trials. That is not something you just snap your fingers and do. That takes time. That takes effort. That takes focus if he's determined to fight all of these. Now, if he finds out he's getting put on paid leave, Rich, all of a sudden, these cases are going to settle. They're not going to settle for cheap. But I think if he would learn that the league was going to put him on paid leave, that would move this thing toward resolution pretty quickly. Well, I mean, not to be flippant, Mike, but it, it, let's if, if Watson gave each one of these accusers a million dollars to, to settle, um, he would still be w one of the more higher paid quarterbacks in the NFL with the money left over from the Browns, guaranteed $46 million. Uh, right, I, and And the fact that the Browns backed uh, you know, gave him uh, a, a cushion with the way the first year of his contract is laid out, apparently, where the only uh, money that can be touched in terms of um, a suspension is just one million of the 46. So oh, you're absolutely right. And it makes a ton of sense. The problem is there have been two other occasions in the life cycle of this litigation where settlement was seriously considered. In April of 2021, they were ready to settle the cases. If you believe what Tony Busby and Rusty Harden, the two lawyers who have negotiated these settlements, are saying, and they, they, they really 
for all the things they disagree on, one thing they do agree on is they were ready to settle these cases. Busby wanted a non-disclosure agreement to keep the payments and all of the terms secret, and Rusty Harden didn't want an NDA. Usually it's the other way around. The party that's paying wants the NDA because they don't want the world to know what was paid. I think Harden wanted to be able to thump his chest and say Tony Busby got peanuts, which means these cases had no merit. But they were ready to go if if Harden just would have agreed to the NDA. That, and it doesn't happen. And look, it I don't know what the amount was, maybe 10, I don't know, 20, I don't know what it was. 1000 I'm talking about. But it wasn't much. Then comes late October, early November, when the Dolphins are going to trade for Deshaun Watson, and they have settlements worked out with 18 of the 22 plaintiffs for $100,000 each. All 22 apparently were offered $100,000, and 18 were ready to take it, and Deshaun Watson didn't settle with the 18. He wanted to settle with all or nothing. Now you've got 22, actually 24, and you mentioned a million. And you know what? I, I, I mean, on the surface... Given everything we're learning now, I don't know how unreasonable that looks. The problem is he's had two prior occasions where he could have settled these cases for a hell of a lot less. I think psychologically that is a tough bridge to cross, and it makes him more likely to just double down, triple down, quadruple down, and fight and fight and fight. That's the problem, and that's why I think paid leave. Not that I'm saying the NFL should use it strategically to force him to settle the cases. I'm saying a natural byproduct of using paid leave would be he probably digs deep and settles the cases. But I just think based on everything that's come out in the last week and what's starting to crystallize in the court of public opinion, that he was using these massages as cover for seeking sexual activity. <laughs> and it was not just a habit. It was pervasive. More than 100, if that's true. I, just, I don't know how you can put him on the football field until these cases are resolved. What do you think the Browns are thinking right now, Mike Florio? What are they thinking? With, with, again, Rusty Harden saying what he said on the radio last Friday locally in the state of Texas in Houston. Like, what are the Browns thinking? Right well, you know, now, publicly think? they would continue to say we wouldn't do anything differently because that's what they have to do. But I'd like to think privately there are some raised eyebrows and some tough questions because I don't think they envisioned the dominoes falling the way they did. You know, I, I always point out that they have a person who carries the title chief strategy officer, Baldy Podesta. I assume good strategy is implicit in that, hmm. but I haven't seen a good strategy yet as it relates to how they've handled Deshaun Watson. And I don't think they, they bargained for this thing to unfold the way that it has. And, you know, if they were being honest, they'd probably, they'd probably just go back to the middle of March and not get caught up in that competition to be the one of the four teams that managed to, to get into the finalist position and then ultimately – through $230 million fully guaranteed it to Sean Watson to get him to agree to the trade. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, the Broncos are about to be sold, it looks like, right? Is that uh, what, what's going on with the Broncos? Because, again, this is this has I – know, I know we're talking about legal issues involving a quarterback and a sale of a franchise, um, but that does have ramifications in terms of Russell Wilson getting paid and in terms of setting another market for a quarterback and how that can – actually cascade into other quarterbacks looking to get paid right now. So um, what what's the latest on the Broncos' sale? That you Today's know the deadline for the second round of formal bids. There are four groups left. The thinking is that Rob Walton, the son of Walmart founder Sam Walton, is the favorite. Now, I've been told it's his to lose, and if one of these other groups really wants to try to to outbid him, because it's basically an auction at this point. It's not like the Pat Bowen Trust is going to say to each of these four groups, eh, thanks for playing, but we're just going to keep the team. They have to sell the team. The league wants there to be one owner of the Broncos. The league, I'm surprised at how long the league has, has let this situation linger. And one of the reasons it's been pushed to a head is because the league wants every team to have one person who is fully in charge of the affairs of that franchise. And I saw someone suggest today it's going to go to Walton for $4.5 billion. Well, if one of the other three decide they're going to keep bidding this up higher and higher, you know, it ends up being like JFK's golf clubs. It's going to keep going higher and higher <laughs> until we get to the final point where one party puts the paddle down and the other one goes and collects the golf clubs. So it could go north of $5 billion. It just depends upon whether these other groups decide that they're, they're going to keep pushing it northward. And, of course, Rob Walton hopes the other three tap out 
and and he can just get it for four and a half billion. So I I was told all along it's going to go for five, and we'll see. Maybe these other three groups aren't going to push it over five, and if they don't, he gets it for four and a half. It's still the the highest price ever paid for a franchise, and it just underscores how much money is available to pay players. I know there's a salary cap, but mm-hmm. the cap keeps going up, the values of the teams keep going up, and the curve keeps going up as to what quarterbacks are making. And I think the challenge with any of these deals, Rich, whether it's Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, or anyone else, where is the cap now and where is the cap going? Because you don't want to get yourself in a spot where two, three years from now you say, I did a bad deal. And, and I think that's going to be the, the challenge for Russell Wilson. And I've been arguing for years that one of these quarterbacks should get his compensation tied to a fixed percentage of the salary cap. Then he's protected against the cap going up so much that he feels like he doesn't have a fair deal. So is this why Russell Wilson's contract and getting paid is uh, suddenly, you know, uh, on Twitter and on social media, people are texting me about it uh, uh, from friends and just curiosity. I mean, where where did his contract suddenly come to the forefront? Is it, is it based on the Broncos sale? I, I think it's just kind of settling in as we work through the, the offseason business. He was traded and that was big news. And, when he was traded, there wasn't a, hey, what are they going to do about his contract? It was just, hey, he's now a member of the Denver Broncos. Well, the reality is he's got two years left. And typically what his agent, Mark Rogers, does is negotiates a new deal with one season left on the current contract. So this is coming next year. But from the Broncos' perspective, there's value, Rich, in, in saying, you know, if we do it now, it's going to be cheaper. And if he went, goes out and has a great year, I mean, we've got to pay him either way. Whether there's a good year or a bad year, we've got to pay him. We, we've already done the broader deal here. We've made the trade. This is our guy. If he has a bad year, we're not going to lowball him. We're going to pay him a market value deal. We're going to pay him less if we do it now. Uh, but, but if Russell Wilson's not jostling for a contract, it's $24 million total payout this year. That's a pretty good deal. When you consider Deshaun Watson's going to get 46, asterisk, and Russell Wilson's getting 24, that's a good deal for the Broncos. So, you know, I, if I'm if I'm Russell Wilson, I'd probably rather get the deal done now for certainty. But if you kick it a year and you have a big season, you're going to end up making a lot more over the long haul. Mike Florio here uh, on the Rich Eisen show. A couple of uh, uh, more minutes left with you, sir. Um, you know, I'm I'm high on the the Vegas Raiders for this year. I'm going to talk more about it later on in this hour. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of kicking the tires on what could tear this thing a little bit asunder. Is, is the Gruden case going to pop up during the season in any way, shape, or form and create, you know, questions for players and things like that? W- what's going on with the Gruden case and how it moves forward? And w- will it manifest itself during the season at any point for the Rich, Raiders? I believe think? that it will not be an issue at any point this year for the team because what will happen is the ruling from a couple of weeks ago that – the case doesn't have to go to arbitration, that the case is allowed to proceed in in a normal courtroom setting, the NFL will appeal that to every higher court. (laughs) It it will. It did it with the Rams, the St. Louis relocation litigation. They tried to force it into arbitration. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declined to hear the case. The Supreme Court declines to hear like 99% of the cases that are submitted to it. But that takes time. And every step, You've got briefing schedules. You've got months that go by. You've got oral argument. Then you wait for your ruling, and then the window opens on the next level of appeal, and it'll take time. And I don't foresee it, and I don't know much about the machinations of the Nevada legal system, but I'd be stunned if this is resolved at any point before mid-2023. And it'll probably be later than that. It's probably two football seasons until we know for sure that – John Gruden's going to go forward with this effort to basically find out who ordered the code red by leaking those emails that forced him out as coach of the Raiders. So this thing's going to, t- it's, uh, you know, smoke him if you got him. This thing's going to take a while. It's going to, be, it's going to go dormant like so many legal cases do. You hear something about it, and then you don't hear anything about it for a long time, and then you hear something about it again. I doubt we're going to hear anything about John Gruden other than the NFL has filed an appeal to the next level up in the Nevada court system. We'll hear about that at some point. They'll be briefing. It'll be bogged down just by the general flow of litigation. And, you know, at some point later this year, early next year, uh, there'll be a decision. And if the NFL loses, they'll appeal it to the next level. And then once 
it gets to the highest court in Nevada, the NFL will roll the dice again trying to get the Supreme Court to take up the case. Because there's, there's going to be an obsession, and the NFL has that obsession, to not have these cases play out in open court, and especially not this one. They don't want the public to know what's in those emails, all of the emails. They don't want the public to know who weaponized those emails, whether it was the league office, whether it was Daniel Snyder, whether it was somebody else. They just don't want that dirty laundry out there. So they will fight as long as they can to try to get the case into arbitration. Last one for you, Mike Florio. You just mentioned the word obsession, so let's talk about Tua. Um, you know, and I, I, I just love the Dolphins storyline that's coming for this season. I love it. Uh, it's kind of under the radar, certainly when you're talking about Lamar's contract, Kyler's contract, the AFC West, Matt Ryan is now in Indianapolis. Russell, again, is uh, to, to talk about the AFC West, where he is. You got Brady, you got Rodgers, you got so much going on. Then you got Tua sitting there with Mike McDaniel and Tyreek Hill. And you, you, you heard Tua kind of get a little salty the other day, bringing up his throw to... Tyreek at the end of practice um and did you catch that because you know it's a reference to what was out there on Twitter so you're the perfect guy to ask this one to Mike Florio my guy Chris Brockman asks me every single Friday a what's more likely question and ask him the what's more likely question because this again I, I can't wait to hear your answer on this see if you agree with me all right Mike what's more likely that Tua has 30 combined touchdowns this year he only has 33 in his whole career. Or he struggles and Brady is the quarterback for Miami in 2023. Oh, wow. Wow. What's um, more likely? More likely? He's got 33 total in his career, and we need 30 combined. This See, I, think there's a, I think there's a chance his numbers will go up with Mike McDaniel, but there will still be flaws in his game that McDaniel will do a great job of concealing. I still say between those two, it's more likely that he struggles and it's Brady in 2023. Or the first guy you mentioned other than Tua, Lamar Jackson in 2023. Oh, okay. 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 If the Ravens don't get this deal done with him, and, and he's made it clear he doesn't want to negotiate this season, there's going to be a window of opportunity for them to finally do this after the season, assuming he engages. There's going to be a point where I think the Ravens get exasperated. I don't know this. I never know anything life safer that way. I think that at some point the Ravens are going to throw their hands in the air and say, we've got to move on. If this guy's not going to take our money, we just have to move on. You tag him and you trade him and you maybe trade him to the Miami Dolphins if they're looking for an upgrade over two after this season. Uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and so yes. it, and so it's like one big taking your talents to South Beach, Tyreek's there, everybody's there, just add Lamar. And that's that's part of the the over the shoulder lurking looming presence, not Brady, but Lamar from Miami. Potentially. But sure. look, it, this is no excuses year for Tua. And you know, last year it took some time, but I think he eventually got a chip on his shoulder over the Deshaun Watson talk. They won eight out of nine games after the window closed on the Deshaun Watson trade. I think that distraction was bothering him. I think the fact that Brian Flores was fixated on getting Tua out and Deshaun Watson in was an issue for Tua. I, at some point, he's just got to internalize it the way Tom Brady would. Get pissed off. And, and that's why I like the chippiness we saw last week, because it's an indication that that's what he's doing. The question is, can he physically do it? Can he stay healthy? Can he make a big throw in a big spot? You know, the McDaniel offense is going to be easy to operate in the short area. When it's time to put one through the keyhole, 30 yards down the field to Tyreek Hill, can Tua do it? That's, that's when we're going to know whether or not he's the answer after this season. But he's got no excuses. They've improved the... Offensive line, the receivers, the running backs. The defense is the same, and it was awesome last year. They still have the same defensive coordinator. So if they fail this year, it's going to be easy to, to take the dotted line right back to Tua, and then the question becomes, what do they do next year? Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, who knows? Uh, it's an attractive destination. If they're looking for a quarterback next year, Rich, that's going to be the number one destination for a guy that's looking to get out of the spot that he's in. Although Brady would be taking a pay cut. Pretty much, honestly, <laughs> well, yeah, like Fox is waiting for leverage for your free agency deal next year. When they offer you money, it's like, yeah, but I can get thirty seven and a half million to just go sit in the booth and not get hit. Yeah, man. Great stuff, Mike Florio. Thanks for the food for thought. Appreciate that. There you go. Mike Florio, everybody. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.